right, we specially scheduled this case, um, Free Speech Coalition, uh, and we will hear argument. Mr. Murray. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court, my name is Michael Murray. I do represent the appellants, and I would like to reserve four minutes of my time for rebuttal. That's granted. <laughs> Your Honors, I respectfully submit that the evidence that was amassed in the court below demonstrates that 2257 and A and the implementing regulations fail the narrow tailoring test of intermediate scrutiny, particularly when analyzed under the formulation of that test set forth in the Supreme Court's most recent decision in McCullen v. Coakley. Let me start with the adult film industry. How about also, since you've just cited it, explaining to us the the relevancy that that recent Supreme Court decision can have, given the very, very different nature of speech that was at stake. Well, it, it involved different nature of speech, but it was uh, under intermediate scrutiny, and the intermediate scrutiny test is applicable. You're talking uh, about the tailoring discussion? Of the yes, tailoring in any discussion. kind of a content-neutral statute that is uh, subjected to intermediate scrutiny, the test is the same and narrow tailoring has to be achieved by that statute. And the Supreme Court teaches us a lot in the McCullen versus Coakley case about what narrow tailoring means and that it has teeth. Intermediate scrutiny does have teeth. And much of uh, the discussion in the Supreme Court's decision in that case is fully, I think, applicable to this case. Let me start with the adult film industry in is, terms is of... Is there a category? Uh, Judge Baleson said that there was not a category of sorts that uh, that was limited to the adult, um, to, to those who made uh, or produced simply uh, adult uh, sexual explicit images. Is that correct? I'm not sure that there wasn't a category. There, there was not a separate commercial category that limited itself just to adult um, sexually explicit images. Is that correct? Well, I'm, again, can we, I'm not sure. can we categorize? There were a disparate group of plaintiffs. There's no question about it. Some of them were involved in the adult film industry. Some were photographers. Some Free Speech them. Coalition doesn't represent the adult film industry, though, do they? It's the trade association for the adult entertainment industry, which includes uh, the producers. It includes the retailers. You represent, you, you represent individual members, some of whom are individual plaintiffs in this case? Yes, in addition to the trade association itself. Uh, there's Mariva Levine uh, is an adult uh, filmmaker and producer and actress. Um, the educational films of Sinclair Institute uh, would be representative of some of the adult entertainment industry. But one of the things that was, I think, important is the evidence was unrebutted that whatever you call that industry, the adult film industry, has always checked and recorded IDs of its performers long before 2257 but, was born. The reason I ask you about the, the industry itself and whether Free Speech Coalition represents them is that in, we're talking about individual plaintiffs here, right? We, Plus, and, 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 and to the extent that you're asking us to apply this kind of uh, narrow tailoring to these as-applied challenges, don't we have to look to each individual member and what's at stake for each of, the, each of them? I think that's one of the things that this court needs to do, yes. And uh, But that includes the evidence from Jeff Douglas, for example, who was the um, chairman of the Free Speech Coalition and described the efforts that the uh, adult entertainment industry went to to make sure that no minors appeared in their films and that they abhorred child pornography and that indeed over the last 30 years there's been only a handful of instances in which any minor has jumped through the cracks. That's one piece of evidence, though, yes. Mr. Murray. And, and, and as I went back over both your position and, and the position of the government, I'm not suggesting either of you were, were myopic, but it seemed to me that there was a, a highly aggregative approach that both sides took here to all of the evidence that was presented during the eight-day trial before Judge Bailson. And in the end, what we 
what we have is a balancing test, right? I mean, don't we really have a balancing test that, that, that both of you are urging upon us? Uh, well, we, there are three issues here. There's obviously the as-applied narrow tailoring. There's the overbreath issue, which depends we, upon... We know, we know what the issues are. You can be helpful to me, Mr. Murray, by answering my questions, because, indeed, we do have to be highly analytical in the way we look at the as-applied challenges of the individual plaintiffs and how we look at the facial approach and how the... Uh, level of scrutiny plays into uh, to all of this, uh, and so I'm I'm trying to determine here whether rather than than apply a balancing test, it seems to me to be from both of you a kind of numerical or quantitative sort of comparison. Uh, if if what we're doing is really something more than because there's, you can't just do what is almost a preponderance of the evidence approach because of the presence of this governmental interest that's, that's involved. Well, I think part of the uh, reason that the evidence was put on that way was because one of the issues that you wrote about in your first opinion was that we needed to compare the amount of images by obvious adults compared to those on an individual yes, plaintiff's basis. and we had basis. no record. And we have a record that establishes that a very high majority of the images of each of the individual plaintiffs who are parties here are of persons who are far above 26 or 30 or even 40 years old and who are obviously adults and as to whom you don't need to have this extensive burdensome but, record keeping. But, but to get back to Judge Smith's point, we need to compare the amount on one side of the scale, yes. that is where the it does not implicate the government's interest, and you would argue that, as compared to the amount that implicates the government's interest. And whether you call it a balancing or a comparison, um, where in the record do we have some demonstration that the amount of constitutionally protected speech that doesn't implicate the government's interest predominates. Well, even their own expert, Gail Dines, admitted on cross-examination that her examination of the entire Internet and the sexually explicit images that are contained on the Internet, only one-third of it involves images of adults who could possibly be confused as minors because of their youthful appearance. And therefore, two-thirds of the massive quantity of the universe of sexually explicit material of, of adults is of people who are obvious adults. That's a comparison. One third, which is potentially is one third not substantial. Well, not compared to two thirds. Two thirds. When, when the question is, well, well, wait a minute. It's, two thirds certainly is more than one third. But my question went to substantiality. Yes, but but you but then it goes back to the comparison. Because the question. But she of also what, said, or was it she that talked about teen porn? Yes, that's. And, and, but. I think some of that was one half of the of the images. I mean, I think the one third was at least the, was the smallest. But then you get to one half, uh, you have you know quite a number there. Well, I don't. I, her testimony was that the teen porn in all of its allied terms, not just teen porn, but all of its allied terms, represented twenty eight to thirty four percent of the universe of sexually explicit images on the internet. But your your expert really focused on sexting among young people. That really doesn't help your case, does it? Well, they were young adults. It just so happens well, that they, they were did young studies, adults that could 18 be to 24. That's exactly the problem, isn't it? That they're young adults. Why, one of my problems, again, with the numerical approach that is so heavily argued here is, why age 25? I mean, I think I know why you pick age 25, be, because you, you want to pick an age that will allow you to increase the number favorable to your position. Why not age 35? Well, because their expert, for example, Dr. Biro, admitted 
that the age range where there might be likely confusion as to whether someone is a minor or an adult is the ages 15 to 24. And he nonetheless testified that there is still a possibility, especially among those who do not have the requisite expertise in this area, to make mistakes with respect to someone 25 vis-a-vis someone who is, say, 18, right? He acknowledged, sure, there are some, there is some margin for error, he said. But again, the question then becomes, are these burdensome and extensive record-keeping requirements justified as narrowly tailored when, by everyone's admission, they primarily apply to adults who could not be confused as minors, and that the vast majority, even if you concede the one-third, you're still talking about two-thirds of the universe of images that are burdened unnecessarily under that comparative analysis. I'm trying to figure out, though, just what the burden is. We are talking, first of all, about a record-keeping requirement, not the suppression of speech, right? Well, some of the speech was indeed suppressed. We have in this record two examples of that, right? Well, we have more than two examples. In this record? Yes. We've got the example of Steinberg could not publish Cupido from Norway because they don't keep records there. Betty Dotson had to take down. That was more a fear of not knowing the timing, wasn't it? No. I think the two we have here is the genital gallery and the fire island. That was suppressed? But they were suppressed, but yet those seem to be what the statute was aimed at, where you can't tell the age. I mean, one of them wanted to be anonymous. Well, if you want to be anonymous, then you either comply with the statute or you are chilled because you want it to be anonymous. And the other one with the impossible identification issue. Those are the two record issues of being chilled. Is that not correct? Well, Carol Queen testified that she does collage art that involves accumulating images from various sources and putting them in an artistic way on a poster and publishing those. And she can't do that because... But the problem with these examples of what's being chilled, it would be one thing if you had, you know, clearly 50-year-old, 40-year-old, 30-year-old, you know, that were chilled. But you have issues, you have instances that are pretty much what the statute is aimed at, where you can't tell the age. Is that not correct? If you concede that the legitimate interest of the statute is to prevent people from inadvertently using someone under the age of 18... What other purpose would it have? The only legitimate purpose is to prevent child pornography. That is its legitimate purpose. And the fact of the matter is that this record-keeping requirement is not just checking IDs. It would be one thing if Congress passed a law that said that producers of commercial sexually explicit material must check an ID and keep a copy of it. But that's not what this statute does. It goes so far beyond that. It requires this extensive record-keeping, cross-indexing. It requires that the secondary producers have to collect it from the primary producers. It requires the retailers and the wholesalers have to make sure that the label is exactly right. And perfection is the minimum. One misstep is a felony punishable by five years in prison. What is so burdensome about what you have just described? And what does the record show about the cost of it? And I realize the economics of it is a very minor factor here, but it's nevertheless a factor. And you'd be arguing it as a factor as if it were an enormous sum. So what, just why is what you have described in the way of record-keeping and labeling such a burden? Especially with respect to those in age cohorts that you maintain could not be mistaken. Because we are dealing with a record-keeping regime that is required anyway, right? So the only thing that these producers are required to do is maintain additional record-keeping and labeling. We're talking about an increment for those age cohorts over and above what the statute already requires. Millions of Americans then under that regime who do sext, who do post on social networking sites, who do send emails to each other with explicit attachments, 
have to put their home addresses on all those images, and since they don't maintain normal business hours at their home, they've got to send a letter to the Justice Department identifying the 20 hours per week that they're going to be available for the FBI to come in and inspect their records. Are you saying they all have the prohibited sexual images? Are you, are you assuming that, that they have, they can, they show actual sexually explicit conduct as defined in the statute? Or at least lascivious exhibition of the genitals or simulated sex, because 2257A captures simulated uh, sexual conduct. And the third, this court has held in the Knox case, when it comes to lascivious exhibition of the genitals, you don't even have to have nudity. A clothed genital can be lascivious exhibition. And, and plain old nudity could be not, correct? True, but, but any, any erotic pose of a fully nude man or woman that includes the genitals lascivious has the risk stuff. of being covered by this statute. Good. Um, I'd like to ask you about the administrative search issue. Yes. And could you give yes. us your position on that? Um, clearly... Why, why isn't it a pervasively regulated industry? Because there are no pervasive regulations. First of all, it's not an industry that is defined at all because it applies to every single American, a photographer, a husband, a wife, a journalist. Anybody who uh, conveys a sexually explicit image is captured by the statute. It doesn't, it, it's not a commercial uh, limitation on it as, as you held in the first case. So there are no the only pervasive regulation that the district court relied upon was the child pornography statutes. But those have no application to any of these plaintiffs because they don't use children in their films. They abhor that. That's a general law that applies to every American. That what, is does a, what does a warrant do for your clients here? And it, it's, it strikes me that in the uh, kind of regime permitted by the regulation, especially if there's advance notice given, it may actually be a, a more congenial type of approach, if I can describe it that way, to being inspected than what your clients would face if they were subject to a warrant. Except that their Fourth Amendment rights are violated by a warrantless search and seizure and inspection well, without that's, probable that, All that does is put, in other words, what my question was. I mean, that's the obvious. I understand that. I was speaking more in practical terms. Well, in practical yeah. terms, as I said, for example, many of these photographers are one and man or one woman operation. They've got to now stay by their, their records at least 20 hours a week. They've got to send the government a notice which 20 hours a week. They have to be poised at all times to, to receive the FBI. Thank you. That's one of the problems with the, uh, with the inspection requirement. But it's not a – getting back to, to Judge Farika's question, there is no – the other thing is the First Amendment prevents <coughs> constitutionally protected speech from being pervasively regulated. By definition, the government cannot pervasively regulate constitutionally protected speech. So this can't be an industry – that is pervasively regulated. Well, you're, you're talking about the entire pornography industry, and we're talking about child pornography here. But, but, Your Honor, there is no child pornography being disseminated by the plaintiffs in this case. That's the problem. The burdens of 2257 don't fall <laughs> on the child pornographers. There's only been nine prosecutions between 2002 and 2012 under 2257. 4,000 child pornography prosecutions, all of them virtually successful. And what's interesting is that in virtually none of them did the government add counts for the child pornographers not complying with 2257. The only people that are actually burdened by the statute are the, the legitimate citizens who are disseminating constitutionally protected expression. Millions of Americans. Um, I see my time is up. All right, we'll hear from you on rebuttal. You reserve four minutes. Thank you. May it please the Court. I'm Anne Murphy for the Attorney General. 
Your Honor, let me try to speak to your point about having to focus the as-applied claims on particular and specific plaintiffs. Um, Would you pull that... the microphone just a, down a little bit? You have a very soft voice. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I think it's important to point out what the individual as-applied claims are and who they relate to. Um, for example, I think you're right, Your Honor, that there is no as-applied challenge brought by the adult entertainment industry. There are some separate individual commercial producers of certain forms of sexually explicit images. And then there's a facial challenge to, you know, based on the um, overbreadth doctrine. And I, I think my primary response, Your Honor, is that the district court did not at all make this a numbers game. The district court looked at the record, looked at the evidence, and basically really determined that the decisions of the um, Sixth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit had been correct. That and I, I would assume that your position is it's not a numbers game. That's exactly right. So is at least as to the as-applied challenge, does, does this really come down to um, uh, how does the requirement uh, advance the government's interest in combating child pornography uh, when we're talking about a records keeping regime that includes a significant number of obviously mature adults. I mean that's that that, that that's a major if not the major, that is a major question that's at stake here. It right? is a question. And a legitimate question for the plaintiffs to be asking this That's question. right, but as the district court observed, what we're talking about is the application to specific producers. And the court observed that with respect to each producer, there is no producer who does not use young models. None in the industry. There was no evidence of, of any individual plaintiffs who didn't use young models. And on the other hand, there were many, many producers who focused on images of the very, very young or people purporting to be very young. So should the statute have focused on uh, just on those who use models under the age of 25 or under the age of 30? No, Your Honor, because part of the point about it being focused on the producer is, let's say the statute's invalidated on a numbers basis as applied to a particular producer. We don't know what the next producer is going to do. We don't know if Barbara Nicky's next project isn't going to be, you know, the youngest prostitutes in America. Um, and that because all of them are using young performers and because for a broad range of them it's not possible to tell how old the people are shown in the images. And the evidence was very clear that for numerous, I mean, I'm sure your honors are somewhat familiar with the record, that there are numerous images in there which are mainly pictures of body parts. And Dr. Bira, the government's expert, testified that he, as an expert, couldn't tell how old those people were. And the district court's point was that the government has a serious interest, and I think based on the record we can all agree, a compelling interest in making sure that the people shown in those images are at least 18 years old. Um, I would like to just make sure that your honors have seen some of the particularly young the producers who seem to show images of particularly young people at pages 5031 and 5025 of the record. And then there's a, pro a producer called First Time Video, which focuses on the very young people. And the district court said that, that protecting, that ensuring that those people are of age was sufficient to require age verification and record keeping um, from the remainder of the people. Even if, you know, on the numbers game, it looked as though um, that wasn't going to be true. All right, but let, let me try to, to re return to the point of my previous question to you, and that is, I mean, I, obviously you would agree as, as, as a matter of, of simple biological truth that there is some age at which there's not going to be any confusion as to whether someone is a minor. I think it may actually depend what's being shown in All the right. image. Fair enough. Um, I mean, it, Dr. Biro, when he was shown images that showed only body parts, mm -hmm. he said um, that he didn't have enough visual cues to determine the age. That's at pages 54, 83 to 84. So, I mean, if he can't do it, I don't think any of us can. And I'm sure if you've 
look through the evidentiary record, you'll, you'll be aware that there are numerous images of that type. And so I think the district court correctly did back away from the numbers game um, and just say if you're using younger performers, there's going to be a risk. The government has a compelling interest in avoiding that risk, and the incidental obligations of keeping the records don't uh, unduly burden speech. Isn't there a problem, and, and maybe it's a modern-day problem. Uh, I mean, this statute is a couple of decades old. We have instances now, whether you call it sexting or whether there are apps like Grindr or revenge porn. I, I mean, there is a proliferation of images that are being made public. Right. And without, you know, the need for you know, experts or witnesses, uh, you could almost take judicial notice or practical notice of the fact that there is a proliferation of this um, and have sexually explicit. Isn't this a, isn't this a problem that, that every person who is engaged in this activity, and my law clerks tell me a lot of people are engaged in this activity, um, are, are going to be criminally, uh, you know, are going to commit felonies because they haven't tagged, they haven't this, they haven't done all these things, they haven't cross-checked. I mean, it's a different era from, you know, That's why well, years ago when you, you had a Kodak <laughs> and you went and you had your film developed and you could take X many pictures. And, you know, as a practical matter, you didn't take 4,000 pictures because it cost you money. Now it doesn't cost you a thing. I mean, don't we really have a problem today, though, with, with this law? It's potentially a problem, Your Honor, but it's... What's supposed to be conceivable, conceivable the second prong of the test, conceivable... Conceivably infamous. That's, yeah. that's, so we're talking on the overbreadth. Yes. It's really important to note in this case that the district court did not out and out hold the statutes are not overbroad. There are no. What the court held was. Yeah, but we're reviewing it. No, I, that's correct. I understand that. But it's it's important to note that the court held that the plaintiffs had failed to show these plaintiffs. These, These plaintiffs, plaintiffs correct, as to Your the Honor. as applied. Absolutely, and I'm not ruling out the possibility no, that there could he. be a future. No, but that given the opportunity to produce evidence of how many images, because as the district court correctly determined, you know, we well, can imagine well, let's all, off, all let's the back text. off the, the facial or the overbreath and go to the facial, you know, whether it's facially valid. That uh, is the overbreath challenge, correct? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Right, but, sorry. But if we look at just the sheer, the sheer number, if we're talking about um, the amount, if you will, should we not understand that the amount of uh, unconstitutional applications, if you will, predominate here? No, because, Your Honor, we, we don't know how much of that is subject to the statute. And if you look at all that, that the evidence that is, true. is like we don't. reports of, you know, sexting and but that could mean all kinds of different things to different people like some of them apparently would like text sexts or you know people not very wearing very many clothes or kissing or whatever and the district court said if i'm going to strike down a federal statute where the evidence before me Strong shows mess. right shows that there are a vast number of instances in which the statute is perfectly constitutional and it's not burdensome for the main core of its purpose, which is the adult entertainment industry. This is not enough evidence. And that's what the it. Sixth Circuit said in connection. Correct. Yes. So Correct. with a different set of plaintiffs, uh, all the plaintiffs here were admitted that they were commercial producers, at least to some extent, and Correct. will be in the future. But with a different set of plaintiffs, perhaps these, the arguments that are being made in this particular case might prevail. On um, over um, well, it would be a different record that we would be working oh, with, I Your Honor. That. But, but yes, I mean, it was striking that there was not evidence in the record of one single, you know, of some of the hypotheticals that are constitutionally troubling, the husband and wife in their basement, you know, these kind of things. The record was absolutely devoid of it, and the district court just concluded that without that evidence, it was not going to strike down a federal statute. But Mr. Murray will say on rebuttal, he has said in his briefing, uh, why would you put 
other plaintiffs to the expense and aggravation of having to do that. There is inherently that kind, uh, some kind of expense and difficulty in being required to bring those as applied challenges by the right plaintiffs, if you will. That's correct, but there's also value in the federal statute. I mean, it, to, to strike down the federal statute, plaintiffs need to create the correct record for doing it, and they, well, they have, have the, the opportunity burden. to do they that. They have the burden, right? right. But, right. And, and what is that burden here in terms of showing over breadth? I mean, that uh, why isn't it, it – let, let me ask it this way. Would, would you contend that what they have shown was insubstantial in terms of the reach here? Yes, Your Honor, because they didn't – okay, so there were the two separate types of possibly unconstitutional applications. I'm setting aside for now a point that really all burdens further the government's purpose. Um, but there were the two separate types of, of – areas of possible constitutional concern. With respect to the older people, um, I completely disagree with Mr. Murray that, that the record shows that, you know, that 60% of it show clearly mature adults. That's not what the district court found. Um, Dr. Dines testified that 30% of it was teen porn. And that's not just people under 25. That's people who are made up to look basically like little girls. So that's 30%. That's a huge amount. Over and above that, Dr. Downs testified that the models were predominantly young-looking and that they would use, you know, cosmetic surgery and these kinds of things that made it particularly difficult to tell their age. And the district court's finding was that younger models are ubiquitous. So even in these kind of unusual genres such as the MILF porn and the granny porn, the people in those images weren't even, like, all clearly mature. It was mixed up with much younger-looking people. And, in fact, the age difference seemed to be relevant. Um, so that's that side of it. The other side of it was, we've touched on a little bit, was the potential application to purely private parties. And there was just a dearth of evidence on that point as to how much, if any, the court said, was really subject to the statute or whether when people report that they're sexting and whether what they're really doing is, is you know, not subject to the, to the statute here. You, you wouldn't really urge upon us, would you, the position th that um, the government doesn't intend to prosecute here, so there's not no, really yeah. a... Stephen's pretty well sealed that for you as a... I, As if that think, dog won't hunt on yeah, you. I think your honors explained to us the last time we visited here that that was, that was not going to be a, a viable argument. I have difficulty with the uh, administrative search uh, exception being applied here and also difficulty with the district court just kind of doing an end run uh, and imposing, if you will, an in advance, notice in advance um, Requirement to kind of to, to save this uh, this search uh, aspect. I, I have problems with this as being a warrantless search, and some of it, uh, in fact, it couldn't be the administrative search exception because some of these searches were in homes, and administrative search is clearly intended for, for commercial. And uh, so, how how do you save this warrantless search? Well, you know, I think that the, this first of all, our primary argument is that the. You know, one of our arguments here is that this, there isn't even standing to raise this claim because there's no imminent possibility that there will be another search. But to answer your question well, directly, I think what the district court was struck by the fact that this is unlike the ordinary administrative search where there will be a regulated industry and the officers will come in and they can yeah, search Yeah, it's unlike the, in the normal, and therefore it doesn't fit within the administrative search exception. But I think the district court was looking at the administrative search exception as an exception to the warrantless requirement, and that what was required was reasonable action by the government. Um, and what the court concluded was that because all that was going to be inspected were the records, which is, and it had an... It well, had that, an, but you are going on to someone's premises. You are, you are going into a home or, or a business, and that is a search. You are well, not... You, you're not, you know, have your eyes closed and you, you come to the box or the drawer. It's a search. 
That, that is true, Your Honor, but, but this is one of the reasons why we don't believe the standing, because um, the evidence before the court also showed that increasingly the records were being kept electronically and that, in fact, it was not necessary under the regulations that there be any intrusion yeah, onto private that the, property. But the statutory provision is, sets forth a, a search that violates the Fourth Amendment, does it not? Uh, the, actually, the statutory provision just says that the Attorney General should be able to search at any reasonable times, to inspect the records at all reasonable times. So the extent that Your Honor is, well, is struggling with the scheme, I suspect that you're struggling with the regulation. That, doesn't that yes. work against your, your, your standing argument, though? Because, 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 he the, has, because the Attorney General has unbridled discretion to go ahead and conduct an administrative search whenever he wants. Um, except that Your Honor is... Your Honours are reminded so that we could get a sense of what these searches would look like. And what we got a sense was of what they looked like earlier, which was very limited. The producers would produce the records. And I think part of what we're saying here is that it seems really quite likely that the regulations would have to be redone and that yeah. in a future inspection program that just as happened in one occasion, even under the old regime, you could just, the FBI could just ask people to email in their records or send their records on disk. And that's then not what the regulation and the statute provide. It's not what the regulation And they provide someone provide. have to stay there for 20 hours a week, that which is, is burdensome. The, that is one of the regulatory requirements, Your Honor, and the, and the district court didn't really address that. No, but, but what's, your, what's your response? Because Mr. Murray raised it again today. Um, to, to the 20 hours a week thing? To the reasonableness of even assuming it's an, the administrative search um, exception applies here, why is it unreasonable? Why isn't it unreasonable to have that requirement of 20 hours a week? Well, Your Honor, I believe that it, the, uh, it's reasonable so that there is an opportunity for the FBI to, to inspect the records, and that would be that would be our answer. But I, I also not, not, not a strong answer. Though. But we, uh, we, we strongly believe that um, since there haven't been any inspections since 2008 and since things have changed dramatically on the 2257 front. Sure. I thought so you gave up that argument. Yeah, is there another Smith. variation on mm -hmm. the same trust us you're argument go there? we talked about mm -hmm. in the uh, facial attack uh, part of this case? There's an they could resume tomorrow. Um, it's true, though we do have, I mean, we have, act, you know, I suppose it's something of a variation, but the evidence was that there was a program. I think the district court was satisfied that even though there were searches, that they were not intrusive, that people were given notice, that the FBI did not intrude where they weren't wanted, that records were segregated, they didn't look further than the uh, actual records, and um, and also it's, it's, it's certainly true that with the electronic, means of doing things and that that was used in the past, that would certainly be a sensible way of inspecting records. Well, what you're future. saying is because they're not doing it the way the statute provides, the regulations everything I mean, the, yeah. and the regulations provide, um, you know, what they're doing is constitutional. So the fact that statute and regulations might set out something that, that violates the Constitution isn't, isn't a problem? Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that even in the past, the regulations were not adhered to incredibly strictly. I, th I think the answer to your problem is the extent well, that then you're, when then we should strike them we should strike them down and let Congress and, and the agency to come up with something that fits better with, with comports better with the practicalities. Wouldn't the, the, that be correct? It, I'm sorry, yeah. Would that um, be well if that's what you want to conclude, I would just like to reiterate that it's the regulations rather than the right. statute. Right. Right. In fact the, regu the regulation puts restrictions on the government that the statute it does not. Does not. That's, that's yeah. absolutely but, correct. Uh, and and you've indicated that in fact even the regulation has not been strictly followed in the past, and I assume by that you were referring to the fact that uh, and I think the testimony showed that there were numerous instances where agents provided notice Correct. that they were not required. Correct. And the instance where the producer was send. in Thailand and he was able to send his, send his things by CD. Sure. And so it's, I, th I think the district court was impressed by the fact that this had been handled in, a, in an unintrusive and reasonable way. Yeah, and so he did, obviously. 
Assuming we disagree with you on the administrative regulation exception, uh, do we have, is there anything else available to us other than striking down those regulations? Um, you could narrow them, Your Honor. For example, the biggest, the biggest problem for the plaintiffs appear to be the requirement that they be there 20, you know, 20 hours a week. So if that seemed um, unreasonable to the court, perhaps it would be reasonable if it were not for, for that obligation. How would we do that, just analytically? Narrow 20 down um, to 2? We said there was... <laughs> <laughs> Take off um, 18? Put something in the suggestion box or <laughs> just... Uh... Your Honor, I'm not sure I have a satisfactory answer to your question. <laughs> I know, I don't <laughs> either, which is why I put you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, my time is up. I'm happy to answer any additional questions if you have them. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to address two points. The Fourth Amendment point first. The statute says it is a felony for any person to refuse to permit the Attorney General or his or her designee to conduct an inspection under subsection C. I implore you, as you, I'm sure you will, Read the testimony of the two agents. These were massive efforts. Premises were occupied sometimes for five and six hours. They took pictures of interiors. They were in conference rooms. They were in offices. They copied the records. These were searches in every sense of the word. But let me get back to the overbreath because I think that the, the, the government statement is is based on a misunderstanding. We put on massive evidence of overbreath. This was a case, remember, the plaintiffs had a right to challenge facially the statute on overbreath grounds. We didn't just rely on hypotheticals. We put on evidence. We put on evidence, for example, take a look at the Plaintiff's Exhibit 37 and Plaintiff's Exhibit 116. 116 is five volumes of adult social networking sites involving thousands of explicit photos and homemade videos posted by ordinary Americans <coughs> with the figures. 41 million adult friend finder um, members, millions of posts every single month on these many X-rated adult social networking sites. These are all um, images that trigger 2257. All these millions of Americans and have you're saying that, that younger models were not, that, that the district court's finding from all that evidence that younger models were ubiquitous, that, that that's a clearly erroneous finding? of he was, I don't think he was talking about the social networking sites. He was talking about the commercial production. Remember, what I'm talking about now is the non-commercial depictions of sexual images by ordinary Americans, not for sale, not for trade, because that's the overbreadth that the government was attempting to address. But don't you have a problem with the, the third and fourth prong of the overbreadth test, the nature of the activity or conduct sought to be regulated, which is here child pornography, which is just a, an, an activity that is, is regulated to the, to the hilt? Uh, and the nature of the state interest underlying the regulation, which is of the highest order? If these were child pornography images, yes. But, but we're talking about the application of this statute to millions of Americans. That, uh, that's a matter of evidence, and I, and I, and I grant you that. But, but Judge, hasn't Judge Rendell's question really put out there what the contest is here? And that is what I, I think you would have to admit in, in every way has been articulated by the government of this country as being a public policy of enormous import, of profound import. So it is against that backdrop that you have to muster this evidence, and it becomes a question of whether or not that evidence is enough to overcome uh, what weight and power that policy has in the whole equation. Well, here's my answer, uh, Your Honor. When you think about it, what I'm talking about are the millions of ordinary Americans who post these images, share these images, not for sale, not for trade. They know how old they are. They know how old their husband is. They don't need to check their IDs in order to prevent themselves from posting images of themselves when they're, when they're not of age. 
this program has absolutely no efficacy when it's applied to non-commercial millions of Americans who don't need to check their IDs to know that they're over 18. Well, that's as applied. That's the as applied challenge, which... No, that's the facial challenge, Your Honor, because that's, in other words, this goes to the category of private non-commercial expression, which was the two, the second category that your prior opinion said would raise overbreath problems. Remember, the government tried to say that the statute was limited to pornography for sale or trade. We engaged in extensive textual analysis with respect to the statute. Right. And so when you apply it to husbands and wives and ordinary Americans who post an image from their home of a constitutionally protected image because they're adults, because it's not child pornography, the statute is applying to constitutionally protected images when it comes to these adults, these millions of adults who are doing nothing wrong except that they are committing a felony if, in fact, they don't post the label and send the notice to the government of the 20 hours of... If they're doing it knowingly, correct? Knowingly. Well, actually, there's no standard requirement in the first crime. It says... The labeling. Yeah. No. Well, in the labeling, yes. Yes. But it's unlawful to fail to create or maintain the records. There's no standard requirement there. But they're doing it knowingly. It's not willfully in the sense that they know they're violating the law. Knowingly means they're knowingly posting a sexually explicit image. That's what millions of Americans are doing. They may be ignorant of 2257 because as important as the government claims it is, they aren't enforcing it. Nine prosecutions in a 10-year period. That's how important it is to the government. I see that my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The case is well argued. Take it under advisement. Ask the clerk to recess for it.